that first year of running Indie Mogul prepared me to make Sriracha the documentary. Like I really felt like I should be making a film now. You could make a documentary in one day. Really? I'm sure the dumpling world is very romantic. What's going on, Indie Mogul? My name is Ted, and today we are in New York City to see the one, the only, Griffin Hammond. Ah! Hey, How are you? If you don't know who Griffin is, he's the filmmaker behind Shiracha, which is the documentary about the super spicy yummy hot sauce. <laughs> it's probably one of the best indie releases of the past decade, in my opinion, because it was completely funded on Kickstarter. It was almost entirely shot, edited, and produced by one person. And it was released on Amazon and Hulu. And this very same documentary actually got Griffin a job covering the 2016 election for Bloomberg News. Now, I think this goes without saying, but Griffin is a super smart guy and an even smarter filmmaker. And as somebody that watched a whole lot of him when he was hosting on Indie Mogul, I was super excited to catch up and hear what he's been up to since hosting the channel. Later in the day, there'll probably be people playing over there and like singing into a microphone. That would have been problematic. Not I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a while. Yeah. A lot has changed. Um, what have you been up to since Indie Mogul ending in 2016? I moved to New York in 2014, not long after I made Sriracha. Bloomberg News was starting a new political news division. Yeah. And somehow they saw a documentary about hot sauce and thought, you need to cover presidential politics. Wait, so Shiracha got you, got you a job on Bloomberg. Oh, That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. I went from 2014 until Election Day, just on the campaign trail all just the time. Stop. Yeah. Were there any surprises? Was it everything you expected it to be? Going to Secret Service run events was interesting, like going, having all my equipment checked by bomb sniffing dogs and going through metal detectors and being in a Hillary Clinton rally or a Donald Trump rally or a Bernie Sanders rally. Yeah. I just, really enjoyed it from kind of a, like a tourism standpoint. And so like from a news standpoint, I just tried to kind of treat it like tourism. Like, let me bring you in. Not only do I want to show you what Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are saying, but I also want you to feel what it was like to be there. So I want to take you through the Secret Service smell detectors. And so I, all of that was interesting to me because I I'd never yeah. experienced it before. So it's not only just being able to experience it, but capture it and being able to like cut it and share it with other people. Yeah. This is just a small portion of our discussion with Griffin, but be sure to check out the full interview in the podcast link below. Now this right here brings us to our problem. What is the key to making a good documentary? How do you make nonfiction content good when it also has to be real and in the moment? So as somebody that's been doing documentary filmmaking for a while, as somebody that has you know, sort of seen you know, the press industry from the inside too, I guess how do you approach making documentaries? Is there like a process that you go through? Do you have any go-tos? I always like to start with my own curiosity. Tip one, start with your own curiosity and research the hell out of it. I feel like something that I'm excited about learning about will be something that will translate well on screen. Nothing is too small or too stupid. And honestly, if you look at the past decade, recent Sundance winning documentaries have been about everything from selfies to tickling to goat testicles. The point is, find something that makes you excited. Find something that makes you want to get out of bed, that keeps you passionate, that makes you want to go even beyond just that curiosity. So it starts with kind of a quest for facts, but you need to find a character early in the process. And I think that's a danger a lot of people get into with documentaries. They're like, well, I'm really into homelessness in America. But I feel like issue documentaries, if you're not finding a person who is solving the issue or a person who's living the issue, then you're going not, through a struggle. You're not really telling a story. Tip two, find a character. You want to change the world. You want to save the planet. You want to teach the world about the long lost city of mole people, mole lantis. Cool. Make people care. A story is a person who has a problem and goes on a journey to try to solve that problem. And then the climax of the film is finding out if they did it or not. Now, a character can mean a whole lot of things. It can mean a hero, a villain, an anti-hero. It can be you. I think it's a little bit lazy, but hey, a lot of really good documentaries star the very people that make them. Money doesn't make films. You just do it and take the initiative. And I said, I'm gonna eat my shoes if you finish that one. And that's a moment now. So then after you've sort of researched, you found your character, um, what's the next step? I kind of have an outline of like, this is what I think David Tran's story is. And so I should ask him about these things, get him to talk about these things. But hopefully I'm going to learn even more interesting stories than what I've just written down. Tip three, write it out. 
Hold the phone. I know what you're probably thinking. But Ted, this is a documentary, and if you write it, isn't that lying? To that I say, I mean, maybe. If I go in and I know that David Tran is from Vietnam, I know to ask him questions about his past, but if I don't know that at all, maybe it would never come up in conversation. Write that story. It will give you a checklist of what kind of footage you want to go in and shoot, and when it all goes horribly off track and goes wrong, as life usually does to people that have plans. Don't forget the next and most important tip. Yeah, I mean, I had learned in college that documentary is a recursive writing process, that you write it, but it will change. Yep, I said it. I didn't say it, but you saw the text on the screen, so. Life is unpredictable. Your story should surprise you. It shouldn't go as you planned, as you wrote. It should force you to throw out those preconceived notions. It should make you want to rewrite the story that you wrote. That's what I love about documentary, is that you can make something out of a failure. If you fail to interview someone, if you show up at the factory and they say, no, you can't come in, you could still make a scene about, I went to the factory and they told me no. And they told me no, get out of here, yeah. yeah. And that happened a lot in news where I would expect to make a story about one thing and it would just fall apart. And now I'm gonna make a, a short piece for TV about how it all fell apart or how this event was completely different from what I thought it would be. And by the end of the process, you should have a story that is not only exciting, but also true. And you should have a character and a topic that you not only care about, but you're also curious and that actually gets you out of bed in the morning. Now this is all only true if you follow the last and final tip, and that is... For me, it was just like immediately starting. Just start. Look, not normally I hate this advice. Uh, yes, everyone tells you just start. Everyone, while they're making YouTube videos, tells you to stop watching YouTube videos and just start. We're all guilty of not taking our own advice. But in this case, Griffin said something that couldn't really back at it. So then how long does it take to make a documentary for you? I mean, Sriracha took me eight months from start to finish, from deciding to make a film to having a finished film. That was a 33 minute film, 32 hours of footage. But I've also made a five minute short film that was eight hours of footage, took me two weeks from start to finish. I mean, you could spend a day on a documentary. We could make a documentary today. We could, why not? You gonna make a documentary today? Let's do it. All right, let's go make a documentary today. <laughs> so yep. We made a documentary in one day. Cut the cameras, we're going. <laughs> we had like four hours to go make a documentary. I think we finished our interview at like 2 p.m. Griffin had to go have dinner with his wife at 6 p.m. We're not just gonna talk today. We're gonna make a documentary. Documentary, one day, let's do this. Yeah. Griffin, where are we going? <laughs> we're going to a durian shop. So the first thing that we did was start with our own curiosity. For things that we could do in one day, we narrowed it down to three topics. One, there's a guy apparently sells durian, which is this super stinky fruit that smells like garbage, and that's not me saying it, that's the New York Times saying it. This is the world's smelliest fruit. Oh my God. Take these and throw them in the sea or something like that. <laughs> How'd you find this durian shop? This is the guy to get durian from in Chinatown. But it turned out that on this day it was closed. This is the uh, famous durian shop that I wanted to bring you to, but they're closed today. This is the problem with uh, showing up unannounced. <laughs> yep. Now option two is a Malaysian beef jerky shop. Apparently, Anthony Bourdain had visited it, but because the boss wasn't in, the staff told us that sadly we could not be a part of the documentary. I mean, that's the problem with businesses, that a lot of times they're, they're the not people there. that work there aren't the ones that can actually make the decision. Which brought us to our third and final option, and I'll be honest, at this point we were sweating bullets, Vanessa's Dumplings. Now, Vanessa's Dumplings is a super popular chain. A lot of people have called it the greatest dumplings in New York, and Vanessa, likewise, has been called the Dumpling Queen of New York. That right there sounds like a great character. And the story that we came up with was pretty simple. A mini doc about Vanessa and the process of how to make a dumpling. Now this story gave us a simple list of footage that we needed to capture. That would be shots of dumplings being made and an interview with Vanessa about her story. So we wrote it out. Now, there really wasn't that much information about her online. We couldn't research that much. And again, we weren't even sure if they would let us film there. So we headed over to this place called Tasty Dumpling, another dumpling shop that we found out that Vanessa owned in the city. It wasn't as busy as Vanessa's, so we thought we'd have a better chance of filming there. One number one sky in the day. Another one number one sky in the day. Right? Another one number one sky in the day. So we got some good news. They said, yes, we can film some of the dumplings. 
counting pancakes. So what kind of footage did you get in there? Well, I was trying to move quickly. I'm trying to get an abundance of shots. So it's like a close up, a medium shot, a wide shot. And you know, I'm thinking, how am I gonna tell the story of how this is made? So I need to be able to start at the beginning and then I need to see it go on the stove. But once I felt like I had kind of start to finish, then everything else was just beauty shots. So I took the microphone off, I threw it on the gimbal and just thought, let me try to get something that looks a little bit more cinematic. I don't like to follow action because I always feel like that looks really amateur, like me panning around. So I'm usually trying to set up shots to wait for an action to come to me. Like I found myself doing the same gimbal shot through the kitchen probably five times. And then on the last one, the cook walked in during the shot and that's exactly what I'm waiting for. Now, finally, after filming, we headed over to Vanessa's dumpling shop where we went to go meet the queen herself. We ate some more dumplings. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, they're pretty similar. Yeah. We spent 20 years to create you know, this brand, yeah. Vanessa's. When we had our interview with Vanessa, we used the story that we had already written to ask the questions. We asked questions like how the dumplings were made. First, you gotta make the dough. And how her dumplings were different than anybody else's. Really, you know, care about the qualities. We make sure every day is a fresh feeling. And then we heard something that we really didn't expect to hear, and that was... That's not belong to us, Tasty Dumpling. It's not belong to us right now. She didn't own it. It turned out that all that footage that we had gotten at Tasty Dumplings weren't actually her dumplings. But yeah. It did? Yeah, it did. Oh, okay. So then somebody bought it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. That was so surprising. <laughs> that was absolutely surprising. Really. Everything we thought we knew was wrong. Everything that we thought we knew was wrong. <laughs> wow. To be totally frank, it was devastating. I mean, we had just spent the entire day filming a documentary based on this story that the dumplings at Tasty Dumplings were the same as the dumplings at Vanessa's Dumplings, that that same care, that same hard work, that story that we had planned for was true. And now I'm not even sure what it is anymore, <laughs> to be honest. It was just one website that we saw that on, right? Yeah. Like, who knows if that's reputable. Yeah. <laughs> that's true, actually, yeah. Realist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but that was a part of the process. And this is exactly what we had just talked about. So we threw the initial script that we wrote out. We rewrote the entire thing. We had to edit a new script together. And here is just a little bit of what we got. A short walk from the Brooklyn Bridge is Columbus Park, the heart of Chinatown, where a box of chive and pork fried dumplings only costs $1.50. To see how they're made, walk straight back to the kitchen. I mean, after you ask permission, of course. First, you gotta make the dough, water and flour, yeah. then put the filling inside, you know, shrimp with some vegetables or chicken. Now, if you wanna watch the full documentary, you can go check it out on Griffin's channel down below. And to be totally honest, if we had more time, I wish we could have investigated it even further. I mean, Vanessa invited us to go visit the literal factory where she prepares all the dumpling ingredients. But that's for another time. And again, if we had more time, we could have done it like that, writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting. But again, this was just day one of our trip. And we wouldn't know any of this if we didn't just go out there and start making it in the first place. Yeah. That happens every time I shoot any sort of documentary piece, some things fall through, some things turn out to be way more interesting than you thought they'd be. I, I kind of feel like if you're optimistic and you keep looking for access and asking people, uh, not everything will work out the way you wanted, but you'll find even cooler things. So there you go, guys. That's it for me. I'm Ted from Indie Mogul. Thank you for watching this episode. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that like button if you do. Make sure you check out Griffin's first episode coming out this week. Cheap thing versus expensive thing. The whole point is just to compare a really cheap, accessible version of some piece of equipment versus the cream of the crop version of that same thing. Oh, God. Also, make sure you check out the podcast link below for a full catch up with Griffin. And tune in next week as we go to Steiner Studios, New York's biggest movie lot to learn how owning an $80 projector might just help you be a better filmmaker immediately. When I'm 84 and doing an all New York driving movie, we will still live project the background.
and they said if you can't get Vanessa's on camera, then like just cancel the entire thing. <laughs> it's not worth doing because Vanessa's dumplings are the best. And she was like, well, 